of uh, my presentation will be about censorship and self-censorship. I will immediately say that I'm not a profound expert in this topic, although as I've worked so many years as a journalist, I certainly have an idea about what it is. Nevertheless, well, compared to many of my colleagues, I was lucky because most of my professional life was for the Viedemosti, which was to a substantial degree protected from all the problems, was immune to problems of censorship. But nevertheless, I've been watching what was happening to my friends and colleagues in other publications. And it seems to me, I suppose, in principle, I can speak on this issue. So censorship, it's some kind of system. Well, I will be just, OK, looking up my records, my notes, again, because I'm not an expert. It's some kind of system of uh, oversight of uh, the um, information and dissemination of information. That seeks to not to allow, to prevent the dissemination of information which the government thinks is undesirable. Nevertheless, despite the fact that our constitution says that we have Article 29 of our constitution says that censorship is outlawed, but I mean, what censorship as a certain state organ? Because censorship as a general notion, I suppose, it certainly exists in any country, in any state, and in democratic states, it's also round because everywhere there is information that is recognized by the society as undesirable, something that need doesn't is it's undesirable to disseminate this information and in this information is it's certainly, for example, by law, we have a matter of confidentiality of medical information, banking confidentiality, privacy of correspondence. This is information that you cannot disseminate. Formally, you might think that this is censorship, if you will. But nevertheless, I don't suppose anybody is particularly, well, really questioning the reasons why this is confidential or restricted information. Because the law, these laws are adopted by the society, and the society has decided that dissemination of this information will do more harm than good. The same is true about military secrets, about classified military information, and um, sensitive information. Again, going back to the system of state censorship. As I was getting ready for this presentation, I read up, read up on this, and I realized that state censorship, for example, last year didn't exist for, for just a very few years, since 1917 till, was it 1920? In 1917, I want to, no, probably I must have lost this paper, my small, I wanted to read out that after the revolution, one of the first decrees said that in the coming Yes, they will adopt a law on the press, which will outlaw uh, concealing information, bans to disseminate this information. But this law stayed in place only till 20, 1920, after which it was amended. And what returned into practice was state censorship as an organ that really oversees what kind of information is disseminated as distributed via the media. So in the history of Russia, we don't have much of a tradition for, in terms of how long we, it was customary in, the, in Russia to freely circulate for the information. The law on the print, on the press, was again adopted very, not that long ago, 1993. And formally, today's law on the press, very much like on the Constitution, says that uh, uh, that censorship is not possible in Russia. So 
demands by the public figures, state organs, and public association to get the endorsement on uh, the uh, or ban the information or some parts of publications. This is Article Three on Article on the law of the law on mass media. Informally, both the state organ, the censorship doesn't exist per se as a state again, body or authority. But there are a lot of journalists with here, and we perfectly know that censorship certainly exists as a phenomenon, and it's getting stronger and stronger uh, more every year. The reason why in democratic countries there is some kind of balancing something to balance the government's reluctance or rather desire to make to put restrictions on distribution of information then it is civil society that insists on its freedoms and rights to information of speech on information what was the name in America I clean forgot what is it? Whatever, I apologize. At the most important time, it immediately, I, 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 it just, I can't remember it. Their main declaration or main amendment. It Was it the first amendment where it says not only freedom of speech, but also freedom of the press? It slipped my mind, I'm sorry. Oh, in democratic countries where they have a strong civil society, the desire of the government to put restriction on undesirable information is balanced by the society's wish to, to make sure that their freedoms are enforced. In this country, in Russia, I suppose, if this exists, then it's marked it's pretty weak, and to a certain extent, it really makes things easy for those who are in government. And what you can understand, like the understanding or concept of undesirable information, may differ from person to person or some authority to another body. And whoever who has can have some leverage, some pressure, or some authority that helps them put pressure on the media, uh, they try to do it, to use it, and when they get the chance. But let me continue about the state. An authority that there is no such authority that is exercising censorship, it is by law. Banned, but we have many restrictions, legal restrictions, which could be treated as censorship as they put restrictions on the freedom of information. There are multiple laws on all kinds of uh, secrets or confidential or restricted information. Um, then in the last several years, about two or three parliamentary sessions maybe, we've got a whole bunch of laws they don't always, are not necessarily against the media, but indirectly, nevertheless, they put restrictions on our right and on our possibilities to write about something or tell a story about it. In my understanding, this is practically every law that discusses any propaganda. The law has been especially, or maybe by, through the ignorance, or especially as it was intended, uh, have the wording that is pretty vague, which opens um, room for any kind of interpretation of the law you may want. When it gets to court, there are excesses of, because the law courts interpret it even broader, and um, that is why this sort of very active legislative activity in recent years has led to, well, increasing number of problems we are faced with when we are about to write about some something. For example, for me, as for a person who works for the economic newspaper, maybe I've never faced strong pressure or strong problems for political reasons, but seemingly uh, 
Well. There is nothing like carnivore, but quite technological law on personal data. Personal information was drafted in such wording that after this law, if you get good lawyers and you work hard, you can ban any media from writing about anybody. If he doesn't want to somebody to carry a story on him. I had this case in my practice when we were drafting major publication. But was it Yuri Kovalchuk or Yulia Kovalchuk, I'm sorry, or is it Brothers Kovalchuk? They passed their biography, their friendship with the president, uh, their achievements, rapid achievements because of that. They attracted serious legal company. Oh, so sorry, they contracted a very serious legal company, and I got a four-page letter from them that described in detail why is it that the law on uh, personal information that forbids me from says that we have no right to write about them. I realized that this law is well. It is a substantial obstacle. Well, if lawyers know how to make good use of it. The same can be said about, well, even there was quite a flagrant case, but somebody and everybody understand that the law on banning propaganda of um, what is known in Russia as untraditional sexual orientation um, means gay lesbian and others. We are an economic publication when we found out that Director General of Apple, Tim Cook, came out. Uh, this influenced the uh, rankings, of the, and we had to write about this. And all the businesses had to write about this. Reuters and Bloomberg wrote about this. And uh, we had a discussion with our lawyer. What do we do about this, about price quotation? Uh, because I remember RBC, for example, wrote just putting it in brackets that this law prevents them from uh, telling their readers what is it all, what is the news about, what did Tim Cook come about with. The thing is that what it worked like when we get another law like this, it is first carefully studied by our legal people. And after that, we discuss what can be the consequences. And this conversation was made up of two parts. First, they will tell us what is really meant in legalese, so what is meant by what is it that what will be banned and will be allowed. In the second part of the conversation, they would tell us what is in point of fact. How about this law, in which cases one could really find a fault with us. But since the law is, they are in part very much like editor-in-chief, they're responsible for risk management too. So they're always prone to interpret these laws given the special features of our judiciary, and um, it may lead to such cases where some things that could be written, they're not immediately banned by the law, they're not outlawed, but it's best not to, because if somebody wants to find something wrong with it, they will. We've got a case like this um, in the same series in 2010, when there was a terror attack in Moscow underground, our columnist wrote a um, column about this terror attack. Not about the terror attack per se. She tried to analyze, I wouldn't even put the word analyze, she would try to understand what could make these women, who would be suicide women, to commit a terror attack. 
after that colon, we received a warning from Roskomnadzor. I just found this because that was quite a while ago, and to be quite exact, I've written a warning that it's Im it's literally sounded like inadmissibility like of uh, extremist activity because the law on extremism has been amended and addenda were added to it about justification, about support of terrorism and so on. And Roskomnadzor said that a number of disclaimers, a number of they publicly justify terror attacks, although certainly, well, not one single word of justification was there. There was just an attempt to understand what is it that makes women who live in Chechnya, what makes them commit these acts, what attracts them, what, how the combination of hard life and ideological, like brainwash, how it take, puts them on this path. Nevertheless, we got the notification from Roskodnadzor that clearly said that we take part in promoting extremism. Well, I suppose that your editorial houses perfectly know, and you perfectly know about these laws, that we're getting more and more of them in recent years. And certainly you indirectly, as I said, why is it indirectly? It's it's immediately is censorship, and because it puts restrictions on the distribution of information, but this is taking a more like wholesale approach, and especially all kinds of legal restrictions about propaganda of this, promotion of that. What is it? Propaganda promotion. The law doesn't clearly define that. It's left at the discretion of those who complain at the discretion of Roskomnadzor, prosecutor's office, a judge who is revising this case. So in point of fact, there are many people who believe that media as a whole are what they do, they just do propaganda, nothing else but that. So formally, we don't have state authority that, or state body that does censorship, but we've got it. It's, it's prospering and it's getting stronger. Censorship in its mechanism can be roughly divided into preventive and punitive. What I've been discussing before is preventive censorship. It's just a ban, a ban to dis on the information that we want to distribute in my practice, and I suppose most of journalists in their practice have would much rather face what is known as punitive culture. This is post factum, is some kind of punishment that follows a publication of undesirable information. Well, that in principle there is practice. Say some press secretaries to the governor or I don't know. Well, local officials who when do they demand that some editorial house should first send draft publication for them to be revised. They can edit, they may cut it. It may also be considered as a preventive censorship. But it's not in the law, so you suppose you can argue that, and I suppose in some way you can oppose it, try to avoid this getting approvals by them. But in most ways, it's punitive. And in terms of punitive practice of censorship or penal, it's what we call self-censorship, when a journalist of the editorial house or chief editors because they can sort of foresee what kind of punishment would follow this publication on their own initiative without any pressure put from them from beyond, refuse to carry this publication to avoid this punishment. So punitive censorship, it follows two purposes, like 
certainly revenge, because we are, they're all human, they've all got emotions. And if you've got authority that helps you express these emotions, who would lose this chance? Well, I've many times seen the situation where people would just show their rancor and vengefulness. And the second purpose of punitive culture is initiating um, further self-sanction to punish for the undesirable so that you won't get it. Well, I missed one point I wished to make. apologize for that. When I was speaking about laws, that formally we, at the level of constitution, the law on media declare that censorship is, is not allowed by law. There is another rule that doesn't work, Article 114 of the Criminal Code, that knows that preventing the journalists in their professional activity by enforcing them to distributing or refusing to distribute the information. That is, in point of fact, what it describes. Preventive censorship, forcing them to distribute information or make them refuse to. And this, there is an article from the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation. I'll revoke it once again when I will say how we can fight censorship. Just point out that there are three rules. Article 29 of the Constitution of the Law and Media and Article 114 of the Criminal Code. Well, now I'm getting back to penal or punitive um, censorship that is mostly used. Well, well, it's not state instrument. Anyone who has some kind of authority or carries some weight, anyone who could be offended by some publication, they want to exercise this authority or the weight they have, they put it to make sure that they would change the situation to do them more harm, more good than harm, at least. What instruments could be, or what tools could be used? There are many, but overall they could be divided into, well, roughly, into ways such as, like, the worst is, of course, physical, physical threats. We all know that journalists are murdered, are sometimes beaten up, they're maimed, they receive threats. I don't want to dwell upon examples because it's all hard stories and we all know about this. But as we choose this profession, we, we all get an idea, at least in theory, that at a certain point in time we can face such a situation where we can receive threats or a real risk of physical violence against us. Then administrative pressure, oh, this is very widely used. Well, journalists and media may get so many problems at the level of a kind of inspections, checkups, uh, at the level of getting access to information in the, like, how they would be interacting with them. And this is also broadly, widely used, but I, for example, will remember the um, difficult story, TV channel when rain. They had a huge number of inspection, labor inspection, then uh, Russian health authorities by making a check on them. So it was obvious that it is administrative pressure they want to put on them. 
in this way it is. Well, for example, for news agencies, well, as far as I know, well, it's just barring journalists some access to some events, barring them from getting access to newsmaker. It's a very simple instrument. It is, there's nothing you can punish them for. And at this time, you can not complain against it. You cannot go to court against it. But as my colleagues from the information agencies told me, for them, it is really the heaviest blow because it, it means they lose uh, the um, income because you are just, doors are shut on you and your colleagues are in the room and they are immediately relating this information. The agencies and journalists immediately lose uh, the um, agency. And these instruments, as far as I know, are pretty, are used, used openly. Okay, they deleted your name from the pool, from accreditation, and they never asked you to attend a meeting with a newsmaker. And these, if you will, well, this produces a very strong effect because in point of fact, journalist loses his job in point of fact, his income. This is all about access to information. So we faced administrative or, if you will, or organizational big company also very are very happy to use it quite shamelessly. I will be discussing I will be giving you my our examples. Well may may not be relevant for you because we worked mostly with businesses, with big companies and um, Nevertheless, the tools and the problems are very much the same. Well, we get this very much um, banker who gets hurt so easily, and, and he had quite a broader momentarium how express his resentment how, or his unhappiness. He's so touchy and squeamish. We were, uh, our name was not put on all the email. We were never allowed, we were barred access to press conferences, even to the forum of VTB Bank on investment. All the people from VTB were barred from giving us comments or interviews. We were, no, we were not on the mailing list. I suppose we were not the only ones to face the situation. Whatever, this is the pressure they put on you, which also for a journalist may create some problems. Well, but the most, as I see it, long-term and systemic death and something sensitive for the media, this is economic pressure when they put in it. Well, most of you present here, journalists present here, I suppose you were, I don't suppose you work for rich publications who can afford to lose major advertising contracts, lose contracts that are known as uh, information services or other sources of their income. Nowadays, the economic situation in our industry is such that we can hardly make a both ends meet. And um, in the last, say, five years, the economic pressure on the media are becoming more and more widely spread and more and more effective. They certainly are attractive for, so to say, our opponents, let me put it this way. In the fact that they, sorry, they are all veiled, they are discreet. It's hard to Okay, you wrote an article, and on the next day you lose your advertising conference. 
and you say, what is it? Why is it that you cancel the contract? Our advertising policy has changed, and we thought that our budgets would be allocated elsewhere. And that's it. Sorry. And you can't even... There's nothing you can say against it, but at that, you received quite a, well, sizable blow, and you understand why I got it. But here is it. But your hands are, their hands are clean, in a sense. Well, you had a very similar case. A case I remembered. when mayors of Moscow election in 2013, when we carry an article on page one, 37 friends of Navalny. Well-founded publication, why? That's why it is on front page. 37 businessmen, not just people, but businessmen, signed some kind of manifesto, openly signed under their own names. Why is it that they support Navalny as a candidate to become a mayor of Moscow? We were the first to learn about it. Uh, we are a business uh, newspaper. Uh, mayor uh, elections, mayoral elections were of um, high import, and this news was uh, 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 was uh, published on on the front page. The presidential staff uh, was shocked, um, and uh, it appears that uh, the people working within the presidential staff are and so uh, people thought that this is some sort of a um, war uh, to start. At this time, uh, the uh, Aeroflot um, uh, uh, started to, to uh, remove us from airplanes. What is it uh, to uh, to disseminate uh, uh, newspapers uh, aboard airplanes? Um, it's not about money, uh, although Aeroflot was paying a little bit. But what was important was the dissemination. When um, people are flying uh, someplace, uh, then uh, uh, there is the Gallup uh, um, poll, and the audience, um, the reading audience, uh, is what the advertisers are specifically interested in. So uh, there is an indirect link. So removing our newspaper from uh, airplanes, uh, air float, uh, flights uh, certainly um, harmed uh, uh, and uh, uh, affected uh, the, our readership. Can we say that this was uh, done on behalf of uh, presidential staff? We don't know. Well, we're told about it, yes. Uh, uh, Aeroflot uh, responded that this was done at the recommendation of the consultants whom they, um, whom they uh, uh, attracted uh, uh, to recommend and uh, to consult on, uh, uh, on uh, economic policies. Uh, so uh, the press Uh, was uh, thought as to they should be removing. Uh, uh, they saved uh, on uh, uh, taking uh, an extra kilo of our newspaper. <clears throat> there were many other newspapers uh, that Aeroflot started to, uh, to carry aboard. And uh, I don't think that it's an extra weight of our newspaper aboard air float planes that mattered. This was the case for this has been has been the case for two years until Viktor Volodin did not uh, uh, leave uh, the staff, um, presidential staff, and move to the Russian Parliament, the Duma. At that time, air float manager called uh, back our. Uh, 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 editorial board and said, well, you come back. We haven't seen you for a while. Can we prove it? No, we can't prove it. 
clean hands, no problem. Has there been an impact? Certainly there has been an impact. Have we felt it? Yes, we've felt it. Do we know what's happening? Yes, we know what's happening. And do we know the reason and the cause? Yes, we do. So, uh, when I say that the economic measures or economic impact They are the most common because uh, the poorer uh, the uh, mass media become, the greater is uh, the uh, pressure, the greater is the pressure. The economic measures are very hard uh, to uh, to um, pinpoint uh, and uh, any um, seemingly adequate reason can be sought. Uh, and uh, lately, uh, such uh, economic measures uh, uh, have uh, become widespread. And indeed, media um, are virtually vulnerable and uh, they have no protection. Uh, there was a time when the Vedamasti published uh, uh, an article which was highly unfavorable from the standpoint of our major advertiser. Our, uh, this was our major advertiser which uh, paid up for about 10 percent of our, of our advertising fees and our managers were, by the way, concerned. <coughs> so they were trying uh, not to increase uh, this share. However, we published uh, an article, um, and uh, 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 an article which caused them to remove their uh, advertising, and we lost 10% uh, of our budget. Uh, we didn't die. Uh, this was 15 years ago. And uh, in principle, instead of uh, this uh, advertiser, we sought and found others. Uh, the advertising market was growing, and uh, we could uh, uh, sustain the pressure. We could sustain such blows. In uh, 2000. 16 or not 2015. Andrei Leonidovich Kostin didn't much like that a big article about Swiss account, Swiss bank accounts. Uh, there was a little a remark that Mr. Kostin had had some banking accounts opened in uh, Switzerland. The entire VTB bank, the entire group uh, advertising, but uh, the entire group of VTB removed its uh, advertising. I can't say what was the percentage uh, of our budget, but uh, I would think about 10 percent. But economically uh, speaking, we could not. Uh, uh, the economic situation changed in such a way that we simply could not uh, compensate for these losses. And I will be uh, lamenting a little bit. I'm editor-in-chief. Uh, these uh, losses uh, is something that I personally feel because people who come to me uh, want uh, their salaries raised, and this is justified. There are people who come to me and say that um, I have to keep uh, some professionals who are being lured by other publications. Uh, I have hard time paying uh, bonuses in the end of the year, and I think uh, why What was the reason to publish this information, the little piece of information about the banking accounts of Mr. Kostin in Switzerland? And it's a great dilemma for editor-in-chief. You have to realize that. Because uh, on, uh, on the scale, you have this uh, 
um, small type info. And even if you re had removed this info about the banking um, accounts of Mr. Kostin, uh, there wasn't uh, particularly anything particularly sensitive in this line of uh, text, uh, and we never knew what was it. And on, on the other part of the scale are the uh, people uh, that you work with, your colleagues, and you can't pay them uh, Pay them uh, um, what you think they uh, they uh, deserve. So it's an extremely painful question, which is uh, solved uh, differently in different newspapers and other media. Nobody reproached me. No, the general director, no, the commercial department, nobody. Everybody clenched his or her teeth, and we had a, con we had a consensus that we did it right. Because uh, once uh, you allow yourself uh, to think about the consequences as to what a particular phrase, word, uh, or sentence lead to, and uh, Suddenly, uh, your publication is gone. Nothing, nothing is is there but the press releases. So the only thing that I did is that I made sure that this information had been published, that this information was correct and adequate, that we had uh, asked for a comment in the proper uh, phrasing and that we were declined an answer. So we uh, performed our duty. We lived up to our standards. That being said, this was a painful case, which still has its repercussions. It did not lead to self-censorship. We did not resort to, well, first of all, uh, there, there is still no advertising. Uh, we continued to, to write about Mr. Konstin, uh, whatever we thought. And by the way, he is very sensitive uh, to photography. He is uh, he has quite an abominable um, uh, outer looks, frankly, and he uh, dislikes being uh, taken photo of. Um, so. But it's not just about uh, about uh, uh, that we did nothing to we had nothing to lose. Um, it was it was different. Um, I think that even if we had had something to lose by that time, we would have continued. I understand uh, some situations. I understand why some editors and publishers, newspapers and stations, broadcasters um, retreat or compromise. I understand that, and I can't judge. It's a matter of stamina, and it's a matter of the price that people have to pay. Sorry uh, for taking too long, but uh, I think that uh, it's the form of uh, censorship which is becoming uh, ever more dangerous. Now we shall arrive at a uh, different topic, which is called pressure exerted upon the owners, the proprietors. For this uh, instrument to become 100% efficient, a law was adopted to ban foreign ownership of mass media in Russia. For many years, the existence of Vedomosti was uh, protected by foreign owners. In what sense uh, were we protected? 
uh, the, the, the Russian government is not wild uh, in terms of uh, in terms of um, their they're not they're not savages uh, coming out of the forest. They know the rules of the game. They're well informed and well read, and they knew what was to be expected from Western-owned media in Russia. So I am saying candidly, I did not personally encounter with cases of direct pressure uh, on the part of the state. I think we had uh, an almost uh, cold neutrality as they understood Uh, what uh, what would ensue? The, the, the authorities didn't want uh, to risk uh, their humiliation, and fear of the international scandal was also a little bit of a of an um, limiting factor for them to pressurize the foreign owners, because the the uh, Russian government. Uh, uh, like uh, the, the its looks uh, in the international press. By the way, uh, the Financial Times, independent uh, media owned by the Dutch, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, were uh, were uh, uh, our owners, and we were not the only uh, newspapers owned by by the foreign uh, publishing houses, uh, but. Uh, when uh, the attacks uh, started in 2014, well, of course, it had started earlier, but the total uh, wave, uh, the avalanche, started in 2014 for obvious reasons, and these were uh, newspapers, um, uh, Lenta.ru, Grani was blocked. Uh, uh, on the web, uh, and there were just a few publications, uh, us, uh, Forbes, uh, which uh, they didn't know what to do. And then they adopted the law, which uh, left us uh, without uh, this protection. In the, in, in the face, in the figure of foreign shareholders. Uh, Vietnamese is, in, is currently in the same uh, condition as any other uh, newspaper, and this uh, vulnerability uh, is uh, through vulnerability of the owner. And I think that uh, all of you know that uh, influencing uh, proprietors uh, can be physical, administrative, economic. Oh yes, there is also the human, uh, uh, the human uh, dimension. Uh, you can make deals. Uh, you can have uh, a checkup uh, on behalf of the uh, taxation service, like uh, with, it was the case with the Russian business consulting, RB, RBC. So physically, physical threats. When the owners are often editors in chief. As we know, we have had uh, some illustrative examples of uh, influencing through owners. And it was uh, literally impossible uh, to uh, prove that the searches uh, in Provcroft's company were related to to RBC because after RBC was uh, 
was brought down uh, to the uh, related uh, uh, to the related uh, and the requisite state. Uh, all searches and and litigation against Mr. Prokhorov's uh, company were stopped. There was uh, a, a very ugly story, I think, about Forbes, the Russian Forbes, whereby there was a, a, a very flexible owner inflexible owner, and they published uh, 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 the uh, salaries of all bank owners and 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 uh, and executives, except for my favorite, Mr. Kostin, his salary was not published. And the new owner of Vedomosti, Demyan Kudryavtsev, uh, uh, suddenly uh, lost his uh, Russian citizenship. Uh, it was uh, discovered that something was uh, wrong about him getting uh, Russian citizenship, and he now doesn't have Russian citizenship. And uh, it's difficult to prove uh, what happened um, and why and how it happened, but it uh, happened uh, chronologically very soon after uh, the uh, a migration service was given over to the Ministry of the Interior, and after the business of Mr. Kolokolitsev's son was exposed in an uh, in a newspaper article. When you ask Timian uh, Kudryavtsev, have you been stripped of the citizenship because of it? He doesn't know. You can think what, whatever you wish. But uh, while uh, this has not led uh, to any um, specific uh, specific contents, uh, uh, and there have been no bans uh, to write about the business of the son of Mr. Kolokolsev. However, I understand, and you all understand, that there is a certain limit, a limit of patience, a limit of stamina, a limit of fortitude, a limit of the ability to uh, to uh, resist. Uh, there's a limit for the journalists, for the editors, uh, for uh, for uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, while we have not reached this uh, limit, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, government in uh, the wide sense in, uh, of the word, and I'm not just talking about the political authorities, but uh, those who are in, in essence, the um, authority of the market, um, those who have uh, the money uh, or influence. Uh, um, uh, there, there is a more and more movement towards uh, 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 towards uh, uh, enslaving uh, the mass media, and there is no resistance uh, on the part of the society. We do not see that. Uh, so, going back uh, to the uh, to the question of uh, distinctions, um, the uh, ability uh, and, uh, and the, the wish uh, to limit information feed uh, to the desirable information exists everywhere. Even the, in the West, uh, we can see uh, and we know of cases when there have been attempts uh, uh, to curtail um, or to pressurize a newspaper, um, a major uh, American newspaper was stripped of uh, Toyota's advertising budget because the Toyota didn't like uh, a review of the new uh, car model because uh, the launch of a new model is always, uh, as we know, uh, a great event. And suddenly this uh, newspaper uh, had uh, an unpleasant review. And so uh, Toyota um, uh, removed its advertising. However, this uh, public, uh, this, this was uh, made public, and Toyota was, uh, was um, had a, a, a very big reputational loss. 
and eventually Toyota apologized and restored its uh, advertising budget. Such is the difference. Urge for censorship exists everywhere. It's uh, about the resistance, not so much the urge to control. Apart from the journalist, there, has, there is the, the great importance of the civil um, society. Unfortunately, in Russia, uh, we do not uh, have uh, any society support. Uh, and if we talk about government and uh, the authorities, uh, those of you who are journalists, uh, have you uh, ever heard when your friends asked you to write about something or not write about something? Yes, there have been cases. All right. Uh, of my university friends, there have been only two who did not ask me with some request. This, I think, uh, this shows uh, uh, what uh, our society has as a so every lever is good, and there are those with bigger levers. But there is one aspiration, only one aspiration, but uh, which is to exert uh, influence. And the human um, influence is, of course, one of the most difficult because uh, uh, it's difficult to decline a friendly, uh, a friend, a friend's request. That's why I've always been teaching my journalists, uh, and I continue to maintain that we should have uh, no friendship with newsmakers. I have never have been friends with newsmakers. Even those uh, who have been uh, uh, better, slightly better than others, and it may be that uh, uh, I would have been friends with a particular uh, person, I always understood that once I have uh, some friendship or once I uh, make an impression that I want to, to be friends, then there will come a day when that person would ask for something. And uh, uh, you will cause great uh, disappointment. So, for this reason, I have uh, made a rule not to be friends with newsmakers. Although this is uh, maybe something that I have uh, uh, lost uh, in terms of human relations, but I think that professionally this was fully justified. Talking of self-censorship. No, I already... I told you what are the reasons for it. In principle, it's hard to be under continuous pressure and receive blows. From time to time, you get tempted trying to make your life easier, making a situation better, and try to meet them halfway, sort of, so to say. But many people cannot resist this temptation. They, many publications, it's from top-down approach. It's some kind of rule. In many editorial houses, it's just their policies that they don't even want to try to write uh, about things which, as they think, may provoke a blow or um, provoke someone 
wanted reaction. This turns journalism as a kind of servicing. And uh, I suppose there is nothing, there is no fun doing journalism like this. And there is nothing about this. The, it, it exists. Well, recently, Sungurkin was interviewed by TV channel Dost, and I heard that um, meeting him was um, just um, justification of self-centership. I don't suppose there is nothing left of, well, journalism, you could call it journalism. There's nothing left. I find it hard. Well, I suppose it's been an hour since I started this talk. It's hard for me to give you some piece of advice and how in this situation what to do about this situation. Anyway, there is always, there is some kind of, there are some limits to resilience uh, and to stamina. I recently delivered a lecture for uh, students of journalism in Ron Hicks about censorship. Uh, I was telling you very much the same thing as I'm telling you now. The leader, Zhigulev, says, well, Katan, you can't, you know. Children, they've come here to study journalism. They're still keen to become journalists. And uh, what you told us, one has immediately to go elsewhere, give them some hope, give them some hope. On the other hand, yes. I cannot think that I'm an example that I would give you hope and still hope. Look, I did it, so you can do it. I'm perf perfectly aware that I just got this lucky from very start. I was in what Timyan Kundiansev calls greenhouse conditions. Yes, we worked in Russia, but after the Western rules and we have a publication was owned by Westerners, and in this sense we were in a very, well, in some kind of oasis. Nevertheless, I still think that possibilities are open for resistance. One has to resist, and uh, one cannot surrender one single inch of one's soil. At least I am fully support this rule. You, at least I tried. One always has to try. Half a year ago, I consulted the regional uh, publishing house that has these problems with censorship attempts by the owners who are government structure. And this is like birthmark on, I have no recommendation for them what, how to win here. But your objective at least to make life as difficult for those people in terms of what they're doing. Make this process as uncomfortable, as hard, as nasty as you want, so that uh, before picking up the f receiver, before telephoning you and demanding something, let them think twice. Should they or should they not? Well, come on, leave them alone. In this way, well, I advise you all to well remember Article 104 of the Criminal Code. And when somebody comes up with some kind of request, demand, or whatever, and they start to put the pressure on you, always remind it that there is an article in the Criminal Code. It's not just, it's just a crime from punishable, it's considered to be, uh, I thought you were not just a felony, and you're like a criminal, you're turning into criminal in my, from my perspective. Law on the mass media constitution, trust me, you are dealing here with love people. And uh, on some of them, it can work for some of them. Nobody wants to think that they are a criminal. Nobody wants to think that they were committing a crime. So 
at least a lecture from you that one has to obey the law, that you respect and obey the law, and law means respect for the country you live in, and the law was adopted for the sake and for the good of our own people. If you think that this law is wrong, well, make, make the lawmakers repeal it. Well, all these discussions, even if they do not produce the result you want, and you are still made to do something which you think is wrong, well, they it's an opposite instrument to what is, what is it? Punitive censorship, yes. You printed something, carried something, they punished you for it, make it hurt. Next time you will think twice before you print it. Now you're, if somebody is attacking you with something wrong, okay, make it hurt for him. Let him at least feel nasty by what he's doing. Then next time, he will think twice before he wants to experience this pain again.